There is a podcast that is a world unto itself. A podcast as boundless as space and as timeless as infinity. It is the place between light and shadow, science, science and superstition. superstition. You've entered the, the fifth, fifth dimension. dimension. The latest series from the Consequence Podcast Network will open the door into Jordan Peele's new revival of The Twilight Zone, and it will go as far as the limits of the mind itself. Subscribe to The Fifth Dimension. Consequence Podcast Network. Welcome to another edition of Kyle Meredith with... It's an interview series presented by WFPK Independent Louisville at WFPK.org. Consequence of Sound and the Consequence Podcast Network. If you're not already a subscriber to the series here, I hope you do take this moment to hit that subscribe button wherever you're listening from as we do put out interviews every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday at Consequence of Sound and multiple times at WFPK.org. We'd love to keep you up to date on all of them. I'm Kyle Meredith. Today, my guest is Alex Leahy. She is back with a brand new record called The Best of Luck Club. It's instantly one of my favorite records that I've heard this year. It's so much fun. It's a bigger record than her last one, and she's got some interesting stories that goes along with it. Uh, Writing it in Nashville because of her love for the show. I mean, there's more than that, but it starts with her love of that show, Nashville. She tells me about it being a concept record uh, that deals with, um, again, her words, the highest highs and lowest lows of her life to date. We'll figure out what that story is, which also involves seeing a psychologist, something that some folks are still afraid to talk about. She's put it in the record. And then we do some fun stuff, too. Like, uh, if you've heard the first single, Don't Be So Hard on Yourself, there is the greatest sax solo that you ever heard this decade. I tell you that. It's on the record, and she's playing it. And we're going to talk about our love for the saxophone and how it uh, it needs to come back into rock and roll. There's a Mighty Ducks reference in this whole thing. Uh, shooting the video for that in 103-degree weather and writing unabashed love songs. It's a fun one. Kyle Meredith with Alex Leahy. The Best of Luck Club is already one of my favorite records this year. I feel like I'm doling out that that compliment uh, a, a little bit. I, we're in a good, really good spot in music right now, and your record fits right into that for me. It's really hitting that, uh, I guess, that sweet spot, you know? That's very kind of you to say. Thank you very much. Uh, I don't know. Is it is it fair to call it a bigger record? Because it's not like the last one was smaller, tinny or anything, but something about this seems a bit more massive, I guess. Yeah, I think it's a bolder record, for sure. And I think it's a more, like, I guess a more confident record. And I, I feel like I was, like, really more involved in the ride, um, you know, and that's just a, uh, a, a consequence of, like, kind of having done it before and not, like, I think every time, I think every person who does like a record is, is there's always an element of, like, feeling their way through the dark. But there's that in, you know, at, at a maximum level when you make your first record. And so this time, although, you know, as I'm feeling my way through the dark, I just feel a bit more, like, able to get, like, down and dirty. So I think that's why it sounds more sort of, I don't know, forthcoming or bolder. Yeah. So I, I read that part of this was at least written in Nashville. What brought you there? Yeah, it was written in Nashville. I, um, yeah, like, I think about half of the songs were um, written in, like, a week that I spent in Nashville, just, like, walked away in this writing room. What brought me to Nashville? I, I, I really love the show, <laughs> <laughs> and I'd never been before. And I'd finished the tour in, um, oh, where was I? I think I finished the tour in, in Delaware, of all places. Um, and then we visited my brother because I had some time off and then decided to go over to Nashville for a bit of time because, yeah, I'd never been before. And I thought I had some time before I had to go home. And, you know, what better place to write songs in Nashville? Just on principle. <laughs> It's uh, it can be a bit dangerous, uh, uh, basing a place off of a television show. How how true did it hold up to that image for you? Uh, look, I don't think I really like tapped into the uh, the glitz and glamour of the Nashville country scene too much while I was there. But you know, it is true that just like you know, the thing that is true as about the show is that like everyone is just there to make music, and it is like truly a music town, which is really cool. Um, I think the thing that the show doesn't really go into is that there are so many different scenes. You know, like the Nashville punk scene is sick and yeah it's just it's actually like way more diverse than i think the show gives it credit for 
I mean, they're playing to a certain audience for sure on that show. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, yeah, you, absolutely, yeah. Yeah, but but I mean, it, it, I don't know. If I would think. I mean, we're only by the way, we're like two and a half hours up the road here from Nashville, where we are in Louisville. But yeah, uh, so yeah. I, I go there a lot. But I, I feel like a lot of songwriters do go there because it makes sense. At the same time, I feel like I would sort of be intimidated because everybody is on their game in that town. I don't know. Do you, do you get that sense of any kind of intimidation in that way? Yeah, I, I suppose so. But it's also really inspiring, and it also means that. Like, like at any point, you know, do you feel like writing a song or collaborating with someone? Like there is going to be so many people out there who are going to help you make that happen, um, which is really cool. Like it, I don't feel like anyone is holding their cards to their chest, if you know what I mean. Mm-hmm. Like I think that everyone's actually there to help everyone and, and work together and just like make the best music possible. And I don't think it's about like, you know, being a part of that isn't about like, you know, the riches and the money and the success and the whatever. It's just about like, actually the MO is to just make really great music. And I think that that's, that's really cool and makes you want to do just that. The title plays into that too, right? So, I mean, this is sort of a scene at a bar that the title comes from. Yeah, totally. Like it's, um, I think the best of what club is a um, metaphor for a sort of like place that we all kind of go to just to sort of, I suppose, decompress with ourselves and, and, and check in with ourselves after having like, you know, a really good day, a really bad day, that kind of stuff. And, and that place, you know, looks different for everyone. Like for some people, it might be, I don't know, like a sitting in a theater watching an orchestra, or for someone else, it might be like going to yoga class or something like that. But for me, it's, you know, going into a dive bar and just having a drink and not really having to worry about what anyone else thinks of you. Like, like, you know how sometimes you go into, like, a bar or something and you're, you feel judged by the bartender? <laughs> right. Um, it's, like, the best of luck, but you don't have that issue. <laughs> so did I read that you, you, did, you did go ahead, you've called this a concept record? Is that right? Yeah, I would say it's a concept record. I think, like, a big part of that is because it was written in such a short period of time. So, like, kind of by default, it, like, captures this narrative that's quite, that's actually quite brief. So there's a lot of detail in it. It's kind of fun, kind of unraveling that and everything. Um, of course, you know, I, originally you just kind of take as a listener, you take it song by song, and and to try to kind of put those puzzle yeah. pieces together uh, at the end, um, playing the game, I suppose. I don't know, I'm trying to figure that out because I, I think the other part that you've talked about that is you say the album is the your highest highs and the lowest lows uh, of your life to date. That's a lot. That sounds like a lot. That sounds exhausting. <laughs> Yeah, totally. I think, like, especially, like, the thing that sort of sees that happen and when I talk, think about, like, a high highs and the lowest lows, like, they both kind of relate to, you know, touring. Like, I feel like touring and, and doing this for the first time as we've done with my first record and going going to the seas and spending all the away from home and all that sort of stuff, it's like a pendulum, you know? Like, you have the greatest time of your life when you're playing to all these people who you you're in this town that you've never been to before and then, you know, the pendulum swings and you're, you know, you're tired, you, you know, you're, you're having a bit of a crisis, you miss your family and your, your loved ones and all that sort of stuff. But, you know, it, it, it just happens. And then, and then the next day you feel great again. Like, I feel like a lot of that is in relation to, to curing life as well as, you know, personal stuff as well. Were you able to get a handle on that at some points? I mean, hopefully, because I guess you're about to do it again. But uh, was there a point you realized, like, or that you, you've started to figure it out? Yeah, it's for sure. Like, and I think that that's just one of those things that comes with time. And, like, don't get me wrong, like, I, I, I love steering. Like, I, I love it so much, and I will always, always come back to it. But I think it takes a few guys to get it right and to and to actually know what we're going to be doing well. Because it's such an unusual environment. Like, no one goes into it straight up and gets it, you know, perfectly right in a way that, like, suits them, you know, to a T. I think it takes time and, and takes a lot of, like, reflection to get there. I mean, you took time to, to work on yourself at this point. I mean, I've also read that you did eventually go and see a psychologist and and pardon me if I'm getting in too personal here, you know, back off. But uh, did did this relate to all of that? Was it just trying to sort yourself out and get the mental health game back on track? No, the, I mean a little bit. Like the psych thing was more. I went through a really um, awful parting of ways with a partner, and I kind of like you know like any breakup. Kind of you're in it and it's awful, but you're always like I know it's gonna be okay. Like it just needs to take time. Blah, blah, blah. But I just felt so down, even though I knew it was going to be fine. And I was just like, oh, I just really like to talk to someone that I don't know. And like, and I can just sort of like get to tell, say to me, it's going to be okay. And so I went and um, in Australia, we have an awesome system where you go to your GP and they write out a mental health plan for you and you get quite a significant like discount or rebate on seeing a psychologist. Wow. And so I went and did that. 
and yeah, it was it's great. It's a really great system, and like you get, I think it's like eight sessions at like this heavily reduced price. And I so I went into this psych, and it was just really helpful. And I just feel that you know there is sometimes such a stigma about going and seeking help for stuff like that. Like even if you just have a small problem, and so I just thought like writing the song and kind of owning going to the psych was something that was a cool thing to do. Yeah, absolutely. Because even in 2019, it feels like the conversation has been trying to get started for a long time. But as you said, there for for some people at least, there still is that stigma there. Like to take the jump is one thing, a big step. But even just to talk about it afterwards seems like just as big as a step for a lot of people. Totally, and so weird because like if you go back to those like you know late or mid '90s shows, like your Sex in the Cities and Signs and stuff, it's like everyone has a shrink, and right. everyone talks about how they have a shrink, and it's almost like a sign of like status or wealth or like being bourgeois, the fact that you have these like problems that, you know, you need to pay someone to help, you know, to, to listen to you talk about them because, you know, surely no one else is going to understand. And now it's like shifted into this thing where it's like you go to a psych and you don't tell anyone that you have. That might be an easy seg then to the first single because the title alone, Don't Be So Hard on Yourself, seems like it fits in really well with what we're talking about here. Yeah, totally. Um, the reason so hard on yourself I wrote to my girlfriend who... She's she works so hard and she's so diligent and responsible and um, will always do everything you know that comes her way to the best of her ability. But you know that doesn't mean that you don't get worn out by that. And I remember her sort of being in a very busy time in you know last year and sort of getting down on herself. And I was just like, you know, don't don't be so hard on yourself. Like it's okay. You, you, you do everything so well and all these things. And and then I thought I'd write a song for her because um I feel like we've all we've all kind of been there. You know, you just get a bit worn out and you just need to know that the end is near and it's going to be okay. There's that line. I mean, I'm having so much fun with some of the lyrics in here because, you know, you're like uh, Christmas without Boxing Day. And I kind of chuckled. I was like, well, in the U.S., we're all Christmas without Boxing Day. I think most of the population yeah, I'm would. Say it. It seems, <laughs> yeah, it's a bit Australian, isn't it? I remember, I actually remember Googling Boxing Day when I wrote the song, being like, I don't know how universal this is. And it turns out not very, but I'm glad that you guys understand. <laughs> I, I think we all know it exists and sort of understand what it is, but I, I'm sure a lot of people would have some questions still, like, why is that on your head? Yeah. It all kind of starts there. I mean, like, yeah, exactly. I mean, like, the thing for me is just, like, Christmas is not locking day, just miss Christmas every day. It never ends. <laughs> <laughs> of course, i got to bring up the sax. That saxophone solo is is so much fun. It's so unexpected. Yeah against everything else that is out there. And and I think that's one reason why it stands out, obviously, because a lot of people have, have mentioned that. I mean, the saxophone used to be as common in a band, in a rock band, as, you know, a guitar, bass guitar, whatever, and I guess they fell out of fashion in the 90s, but you're making a strong case for bringing that back. Yeah, I know. Sax stigma is something that needs to be um, bought one one solo at a time. And, yeah, I mean, I, yeah, I've been playing sax for friends since I was a child, and, yeah, I think it was just one of those things where it was always going to happen, and I remember showing my manager and my mom the track um, or the sax solo, and they were both like, we've been waiting for this moment. <laughs> so I think it was like, in my world, it was sort of like this inevitable thing that was eventually going to happen, but I sort of loved that my playing of the saxophone to, you know, the general public seems like like a party trick when actually like that instrument has been a humongous part of my life for well over a decade now. Is it only that track on the record or is it featured around the record? There's a few other tracks that it's on. There's a song called Isabella. Uh, you've heard the record. So there's a song called Isabella mm-hmm. that's um, got like a few horns in it that I played on. And also um, Spoken History as well uses a saxophone kind of in a different way to a solo, but it's, it's a more textual kind of addition to the song. It's probably going to allow itself for some really fun live moments at least. I don't know how far you're going to take this, but... You know, let that solo fly for as long as it feels good. I'll I'll be there for the whole thing. <laughs> Excellent. I need to get my saxophone service actually. So uh, <laughs> I'm going to be too squeaky when when it or when it, when it comes out on tour. Is there a Mighty Ducks reference in that song too? Oh yeah. I, I, so I've heard it dozens of times. I guess I'm just missing. I'm I'm always a little bit later on the lyrics. It takes me a moment, you know. Yeah, uh, direct reference to Emilio Estevez uh, in his greatest role of all time. <laughs> his greatest role. I I don't think I would argue with you on that. I mean, I might put Young Guns close up there, but just you know, for for fun. I don't know. It's yeah. I don't, I also want to ask about the video because uh, well, I, I, in America we'd say it was like a, it was 113 degrees Fahrenheit, 45 Celsius for you. But you know, for us, 113 degrees when you shot that video, how in the world did you do that? 
Oh, look, I had a lot of help and support. Um, it was a uh, yeah, it was designated kind of shade area where we were pretty well looked after by the crew. They made it as comfortable as possible for us. But yeah, the day didn't end without um, some sunburn for a lot of people, and yeah, it was pretty pretty hot. Yeah, but this is becoming a little bit normal for Australia. I mean, it, it gets it's been doing that here too, especially you know anywhere in the country and and the world, but. But it sounds like, you know, the environmental catra- catastrophes happening around the world, that, like Australia is on fire. Yeah, for sure. And also, like, you know, I remember being in Nashville in your summer and just the humidity is so, so high and thick. In Melbourne, where I'm from, we don't really have that as much. It's just like, yeah, super dry and it does feel like it's on fire. Can you, can you see that changing uh, the landscapes and, and just the way of life as much as it's... Because all I can do is read about it at this point, you know, I've not made the visit, so... Oh, yeah, for sure. Like, it's just without a doubt that it's happening. And I think, like, hopefully the lifestyle changes that are going to happen are going to be more to prevent, you know, it getting any worse as opposed to, like, having to, you know, deal with the earth getting hotter. Right. Um, hopefully we can find a way that we can sort of slow it down or, or, or make it stop in its tracks rather than have to um, have to just deal with the consequences. I'll switch it back to um, maybe a happier little note before I get off of here. I'm bringing up a couple of the other songs. Later on the record, you get the uh, the Black RMs and, and I Want to Live With You. And this is a practice, uh, if I'm hearing this right, at the Unabashed Love Song. Is that right? Oh, yeah. Yeah, there's, um, I reckon, along with the sax solo, the, um, like, very direct and, like, unashamed, like or shameless like love song has kind of gone out of fashion as well and i think like those two songs are very much like yeah my crack at just doing the like straight up love song um in a very direct kind of fashion but i remember having conversations with my friends about like you know the song i will always love you by dolly parton and just how like there's no way that the song will fly now and i feel like a, a reason for that is because it is so direct and and so yeah just like this flat out love song yeah. um without any sort of qualifiers or conditions and um i feel like people today are almost like afraid of that i, I mean is there still a mm. challenge to that is, do, do you do you do you hold anything back you know before it goes one way and i don't know it almost doesn't seem like you do you do yeah i think i i think there's some things that i hold back or like you know it's all maybe like struggle the process enough to to kind of like articulate it in, in you know, in song, <laughs> so to speak. But I think, you know, being in love, you know, when you're there, like in a way it's almost like the easiest thing to, to be a fun about, which is really beautiful. Yeah. And I hope that everyone gets to feel that. Well, I absolutely love how it turned out in these songs, uh, the whole record. I mean, uh, I'll give you the compliment again, the Best of Luck Club. It's such a fun album that I'm so happy that you did. Thanks, mate. I really appreciate it, and I really appreciate all the support coming from Louisville as well. It's just, it blows my mind. Yeah, I'm so sorry. Anytime. Keep sending the music this way. Uh, congratulations on this one, and Alex, it was a pleasure talking to you. Thank you so much. I'm, I'm sure we'll see you again soon. Absolutely. Take care. Bye. Big old thanks to Alex Leahy for the chat right there. Again, the new record is called The Best of Luck Club. Hey, before you get out of here, uh, take a moment to hit the subscribe button. If you haven't already, you can uh, subscribe to us anywhere you get your favorite podcasts from, including iTunes and Apple Podcasts, uh, Spotify, and YouTube as well. You can follow along there. And if you feel so inspired, go ahead and uh, give the series a rating and leave a review. After that, you can head over to WFPK.org, where I do a show every Monday through Thursday from noon to 3 Eastern, where you can also find some bonus episodes of this series. Consequenceofsound.net has your music and film news. You can find me at Twitter, at Kyle Meredith, and Facebook slash Kyle Meredith. Does it for another edition. I'm Kyle Meredith. I'll see you next time. Consequence Podcast Network.